السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا My dear viewers welcome back to another live edition of Ask Huda and allow me in the beginning to congratulate you with the Eid I hope you enjoyed your Eid happy and blessed Eid happy and blessed day and days May the Almighty Allah bless all your lives, all your times, all your loved ones. And uh, welcome back. And our phone numbers should appear on the bottom of your screen. And they are as follows. The first couple numbers are for WhatsApp calls only. Area code 001-361-489-1503. Alternatively, area code 001-349-806-0025. And the two local numbers beginning with area code 002, then 01005469323. Finally, area code 002, then 02385134. You can watch us live on uh, the uh, Intelsat, Nilesat, Nigerian Satellite, Sohailsat, and also on the various social media platforms, whether my Facebook page, M Salah Official, or Huda TV Facebook page, or our YouTube channel, which is Huda TV. Bismillah, let's take the first caller for the day. Assalamu alaikum. Adam from Nigeria, welcome to Ask Huda Adam. Yes, sir. We hear you, Adam. Go Thank ahead. You, sir. sir, I just want to greet you, Sheikh. Thank you. Appreciate it. You. How, how was your heart, sir? Marvelous. Amazing. MashaAllah la quwata illa billah. It was beautiful and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept from us and all the pilgrims. Thank you so much, Adam. That's a very uh, uh, nice wish from you. And do you have a question today? Adam? Anyway, thank you so much for calling and for praying for us. And uh, congratulations. May Allah bless you and your family. Maybe you can take another call. Uh, Farah from the USA. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. If we did to ask not spend. Can you raise your voice, Farah, please? Yes, alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am in Mecca right now and uh, for the first night, due to the traffic and everything, we could not make it to Mena before midnight or like around midnight. So... What is the ruling? We were there in Mina, but later after the midnight. Got your question, Farah. Thank you so much. And I hope not only Farah would hear the answer, but everyone who's in Hajj have a similar situation, or those who will be going for Hajj in the future, inshallah. Spending the night either entirely on the Eid night and the following two nights in Mina is wajib, is compulsory whether the entire night or at least most of the night so if the night consists of 12 hours if you spend seven eight hours you can leave some people due to the heavy traffic have been trying to return back to mina after they perform tawaf al ifada and uh, obviously sa'i for many they were not able to return until it is past midnight i myself and those who were with me once spent four hours in the bus and we were lucky to get to the tunnel then we had to walk uh, you know for about one mile or so so for attempting and trying to get to Mina even if you don't make it at all you're not blameworthy if you get to spend six hours four hours three hours one hour no problem Due to the ayah of Surah At-Taghabun in which the Almighty Allah says فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ Keep your duty to Allah to the best of your ability. Do as much as you can. Oh Allah, I've done my tawaf. I've been trying to return to Mina. Some people paid 300 riyal, 
400 riyal, 500 riyal for a ride which is only a couple miles. And they couldn't make it. They are not blameworthy. To the extent that we have to get off the bus and walk, and we still were not able to make it before midnight. Am I blameworthy? Do I have to give dumb or offer a qurbani or fidya, a ransom? Absolutely not. Not even a few sadaqah here or there. You do not owe anything. And there is a difference between somebody. Most of us have rooms in the hotels in addition to our camping manner. Somebody returned and said, wow, finally air condition and the food. And you know what? I'm just going to spend the night here. So willingly and without a valid reason, he or she spent the night in Mecca, not in Mina, in the hotel room, not in the camp. In this case, they must make it up by offering a fidya to slaughter a sheep or a goat like they had you, but it's called fidya. And it must be distributed entirely among the poor people of Mecca. But somebody who have made an effort and tried, even if they didn't make it, they are not blameworthy. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. So Sister Farah, congratulations. And since you're still in Mecca, include us all in your prayers, please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Amatullah from the USA, welcome to Ask Wada. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm asking my question, obviously, for next year. Could you please but raise your voice, I know people. Could you please raise your volume? Okay, I'll try. Is that better? Mm, maybe, are you... There's a big delay. Are you talking from a speakerphone? Uh, no, I'm on Bluetooth. This is much better now. Maybe it is a Bluetooth, actually. If you, but anyway, I hear you better now. Proceed on, please. Good. Okay. Uh, uh, for next year, uh, I had read that um, people can go to combine to make the sacrifice. Uh, like seven people could slaughter a cap. But if somebody if uh, doesn't have a lot of money, like a couple of sisters or maybe th two or three, could they share in the cost of slaughtering a sheep? All right, got your question, sister. Uh, we Amatullah. wouldn't intend to, okay, we don't mean to be defiant of the Sunnah. Yes, we got your question. We just want to do it. Let's begin by okay. recognizing the Qurbani. Is it compulsory or an emphatic Sunnah? According to the opinion of the vast majority of the scholars, it's an emphatic sunnah, highly recommended for those who have the means. I am as a husband and a father. You have some surplus, then you should give a qurbani. You slaughter it on the Eid day or the following couple days on behalf of myself, my wife, and my kids. If I have a maid or whatever, everyone is included in this one qurbani. Well, can seven families participate in slaughtering a cow, a buffalo, or a camel? Yes, that is permissible. One seventh per each family. Well, if you cannot afford it, can at least two families participate in one sheep? No, that is not permissible. Less than a sheep for the family is not permissible. Less than one seventh per family in a cow or a camel or a buffalo isn't permissible. So what would it count? It would count as a voluntary charity or a meat that you take home. But this is not Uthiyah. al Uthiyah or the Qurbani have certain requirements must be met. And by the way, those who cannot afford the means, we said they're not blameworthy whatsoever. So if we only have five people or six people who can participate in a cow. Then somebody said, you know what, for the remaining one seventh, I would take it, but for my family at home to store it, to save it in the fridge so we can use it. Is it permissible? Yes, it is permissible. So this one seventh, which is extra, is for your personal use, while the other one seventh is for the Qurbani. 
less than one seventh per family is not Qurbani. Less than one sheep per family is not Qurbani. Barakallahu fiki amatullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salim from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Salim, which part of Ghana are you from? I'm from Tashiman. You know, inshallah, in a few days, myself, Wa'il Ibrahim and Mufti Mink will be visiting you guys for about three days, inshallah. So hope to see you all there, inshallah. Oh, yeah. What is your question? Inshallah. Wallahi, Sheikh, Wallahi, I want to tell you, Wallahi, I love you for the sake of Allah, Wallahi. Ahabbaka alladhi ahbabta nafi. This is what I should say and reply to your beautiful word in Arabic, which means, may the one whom you love me for his sake, love you as well. MashaAllah, it's nice to hear that from you, Salim. Barakallahu feekum. So do you have a question today? May Allah reward you for the work you are doing. Tell me, do you have a question? I don't have any question. I just want to tell you, I love you for the sake of Allah. And may Allah reward you. And I like God to tell you to those. Thank you so much. Subhanallah, in many lectures, in many episodes, you find some people are calling and they're taking time, making an effort to call and say, I don't have a question. I'm just, uh, I'm just calling to tell you that I love you for the sake of Allah. This is very lovely. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advised us to do so. Number one, to show appreciation. Number two, to give thanks or gratitude. And if you love somebody for Allah's sake, you should inform him. So he was sitting with his companions and somebody passed by. So one of his uh, companions was sitting with him said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, you know this guy, I love him for the sake of Allah. He said, did you inform him? He said, no, I didn't. He said, you should chase him and tell him that I love you for the sake of Allah. So he did. And then he also taught us that when somebody tells you, I love you for the sake of Allah, not because of a business, not because I want to marry your sister, not because I want you to help me for whatever worldly matter, then when somebody tells you, I love you for the sake of Allah, you should tell him back, may the one whom you love me for his sake love you as well. And you know the quality of loving one another for the sake of Allah, like now when Salim tells me so, I don't know him. We haven't met in person. I don't know how he looks like. And whether he is poor or rich, what is his capacity in the community? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. And when I hear that and I tell him the same, on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection, on the day of fear, when everybody will be so frightened, the Almighty Allah will call upon such people and say, what are those who used to love one another for my sake? So they rise up. Then Allah the Almighty will tell them, today I shall shelter you in my shade when there will not be any shade but his. So may the Almighty Allah make us among them. Ameen. Thank you, Salim from Ghana. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sufyan from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Sufyan, can you hear me? Okay, let's take Abu Abdurrahman from Italy because we gotta go, go for a short break quickly soon after Abu Abdurrahman's call. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya Sheikh, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah, Abu Abdurrahman. Happy Eid, how are you? Alhamdulillah, how was the uh, Hajj? It was great, mashallah. It was magnificent. Alhamdulillah, may Allah accept. Amen. Before the question, I want, do you have any plan to come to Gambia with your guys, say Mufti and others? Why not? Make an arrangement and we'll visit you in Gambia. Uh, among all the countries Please, in the yeah. world, I love Africa most. So whenever we're invited may I, may, to any may country I make in Africa, you come to Gambia? Yeah, sure, inshallah. One day. Barakallahu feek. So what is your question about okay. Rahman? My, 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 my question is, uh, in our work site, I am the second supervisor. Sometimes, you know, to make the workers 
to enjoy the works, I just make small joke with them. And some of them are girls. I don't know how Islam say that one. Well, I won't be able to give you an answer unless if I hear what you say. Oh, you know what I mean? So there are certain words a person can be joking and it's pers uh, permissible, simply okay, no problem. And there are words which may be acceptable in the culture, but religiously is not acceptable. So maybe you can send your question writing like this is what I normally say and when I address the workers, the co-workers or the employees and I'm their employer or their supervisor. So I encourage them with words. Uh, I joke with girls. What do you, tell me what do you say? in writing and I'll be able to help you inshallah in this regard. Brothers and sisters, it is time to take a short break and inshallah I'll be back in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back my dear viewers to the second segment of today's Ask Huda program. We have some callers already. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister wa Samia from Nibal, welcome to Ask Huda Samia, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Yes sir. Go ahead, I hear you. Welcome to Ask Huda. What is your question, please? Sir, how can we get a close relationship with our Allah? Thank you, Sanya. Barakallahu feekum. The question is every believer's question. How can we have a close relation to the Almighty Allah? Allah will answer this question. In the sacred hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, narrated that the Almighty Allah said, there is nothing that my servant can do in order to draw close to me better than fulfilling what I have ordained upon him. And my servant will continue to draw nearer and nearer towards me through offering nawafil, voluntary acts of worship, until I love him. And when I love him or her, I become his hearing with which they hear their sight with which they see, their hands, their feet, which simply means that the Almighty Allah will guide all your body parts to only to do what pleases Him. You become righteous. So in order to have a close relationship with Allah, do you offer your five daily prayers on time? Alhamdulillah. Next. What about the voluntary prayers before or after those emphatic uh, Sunan for innocence, as you know that the Messenger of Allah said, whoever will pray on regular basis, on daily basis, 12 units, Allah will build a house for him or her in paradise. Four rak'ahs, two by two before Dhuhr, two after Dhuhr, two after Maghrib, two after Isha, and two before Fajr. I do. And do you pray what too? Yes, I do. Wonderful. As a matter of fact, sometimes I do pray night prayer and tahajjud. Great. Since Ramadan, have you been fasting, voluntary fasting? Yes, sir. And mashallah, the first nine days of the month of the Hijjah, not only the day of Arafah, I have been fasting. These are all acts which definitely make Allah love you. And when Allah loves you, then He will protect you against sinning and will protect your body parts and your limbs again is doing a thing which displeases him and then he will grant you husn al khatima the best conclusion to your life and you will be walking on earth and allah has already prepared a place a palace and a property for you in heaven well in addition to do you have a daily homework of reciting quran yes i read about one para every day this is marvelous and I try to memorize a few verses every day. Great. Well, unfortunately, I don't know how to recite in the Quran because I'm not an Arab. I am a revert. I'm trying though. But I listen. I put my ear pods on my headphone and I listen to some beautiful Qaris. Wonderful. This is similar to reading if you are an Arab and a fluent reciter. And whenever I have some surplus, I give in a charity. MashaAllah. 
Congratulations, Allah loves you. Because a person who will do what I mentioned earlier is a person whom Allah loves and facilitates for him or her to choose to do these voluntary acts of worship, not only what is obligatory and mandatory. Thank you, Samia from Nepal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Mahmoud from the KSA, welcome to Ask Huda. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my question is, is it permissible to travel to the Maldives that I can avoid from? Is it permissible to travel to the Maldives for what reason? Traveling. You mean for tourism? You go to some islands? Yes. Yeah, well, there are some good yes. islands on the Maldives where you will not see nudity and you can choose. You know, based on your travel agent, you say, I want to go to one of those uh, islands where Muslims go to. Uh, I don't want to be around nude people or uh, people are wearing swimsuits and so on. It is permissible. If this is the case, yes, we are permitted and allowed to enjoy the creation of Allah. In the USA, I used to take my family in my uh, van and go to the beach and we set our tent and about a mile right and a mile left, no one will be around us. Is it permissible to go swimming, to enjoy the beach? In this case, there is no problem. There are other beaches which we all know that if you go there, you will see a lot of nudity. It is not permissible to go there even by yourself. So you do your homework before you travel somewhere. You go to Langkawi Island in Malaysia. Amazing. Benin. Amazing. A lot of Muslims and uh, you know very conservative so you can go swimming and waterfall and you can go hiking and you cannot and you will not be doing anything haram so you get to choose your package okay if you know that you're going to an island there are hundreds of them you get to an island where there will not be any violation there bismillah enjoy it alhamdulillah may allah bless you it is halal to have lawful fun. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sahil from Bangladesh. Welcome to Ask with Sahil. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, my question is, uh, when does a person become uh, kafir uh, while avoiding salah unintentionally? My, I mean, I sometimes uh, do my pray Isha prayer late uh, intentionally um, before I sleep. Um, so sometimes I have the uh, fear that uh, there might be an earthquake or some other uh, thing and I would die uh, without uh, performing my Isha. Um, so do I die as a kafir then? Uh, so that's my yeah, fear. Yeah, sahl, and, uh, sahl, Habibi, let me help you rephrasing your question. Okay? What time do you pray Isha? Um, I normally sleep at uh, 10 p.m. and uh, after 10 p.m. so uh, yeah before I sleep uh, 30 minutes before I sleep something uh, like that something and, like that and what is the azan time for Isha in Bangladesh in your uh, locality 8 22 p.m. wonderful do you live nearby a masjid where you can hear the adhan uh, sometimes I go to mosque sometimes I don't um, my question is, is there a nearby mosque? Yes, yes. There is a nearby yes, mosque. Yes, yes. Okay. Let me answer you. It is best to attend the prayer in congregation because I can start listing and counting for you the merits and the extra reward for going to the masjid and attending the prayer in congregation over praying at home by yourself or with family members. Yet, if you still choose to pray at home, your prayer is valid. Yes, it's much lesser word, 27 degrees, but it is valid. <clears throat> well, sometimes I delay my Isha an hour or two. Is it before midnight? Yes, your Isha is valid. So don't worry about being a kafir. I already made an effort, made wudu. And I said, Allahu Akbar. And I said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And I said in the root sharif, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. 
Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. You're a Muslim, you're a believer. Don't let this evil thought haunt you. Okay? You're a Muslim, you're a mu'min, you're a believer. Alhamdulillah. Right? Barakallahu feekum sahl from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Ummu Amina from Emirates, welcome to Askoda. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I have a, a, a situation where I need an advice. Mm -hmm. So my, my family, my sisters and some of my brothers, they, they believe in consulting uh, people that foretell the future, mm. that tells or they say that they see a dead person and the dead person is telling them what to do and things like that. Mm. I've, I've known that all my life. And uh, maybe like 13 years ago, I was sick. I had clinical depression mm. and they were taking me to these people. And that's when I really experienced firsthand what they do. And subhanAllah, it was it's really sad and, and, and horrible. Mm. And since I got better, I stay away from them because I try to tell them that this is not Islamically correct and they believe it's Islamically correct. Mm. So I stayed away from them. And every time I try to get closer and they still bring these things up. And my mother had passed away uh, since I was little. And they will keep telling me that these people see my mother and my mother is saying this. And I will tell them that I don't want to listen to this and they want to force me to believe or join them in doing all of this things. I separate myself from them. I only call them one the more. Taib, Ummu Amina, thank you. I think I got your point. Uh, in many TV stations in North America, they run commercials ads in between the programs and the news. This guy says that he can read your palm and tell you the future. And they give you the first time to try for five dollars. Then of course, and you want to convince even non-Muslims that this guy is a faker. And this is not true. And whatever he is telling you that he can never read your future from your palm or from anywhere else. Because the future, only Allah the Almighty knows about it. So I tell them in a language that they can comprehend better. In, in the USA, many people invest in the stock market. So I say, if this loser is running this ad and asking you to call so that you, know, you pay $5 in order to read your palm and tell you the future, don't you think that he can make a fortune you know, through knowing the future better than wasting his time reading somebody's palm? for five dollars if you were to know the stock market which share is going up which commodity will be more expensive or in the forex exchange which currency is going up to buy which currency is going down to sell they can make billions with ease but they don't they're fakers they're liars and obviously we are as Muslims believe that the Almighty Allah stated in Surah Luqman the last verse of uh, in, 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 in Surah Luqman, Inna Allah indahu ilmu sa'a wa yunazzilu al-ghaytha wa ya'lamu ma fi al-arham wa ma tadri nafsum maadha taksibu ghada and this is the catch in the ayah wa ma tadri nafsum bi ayy ardin tamul so wa ma tadri nafsum maadha taksibu ghada no soul whether human beings or jinn whom the sorcerers and the fortune tellers seek their help nor the sorcerers themselves, obviously, know what is going to happen to them or to others in the morrow, next day, next hour. وَمَا تَدْرِي نَفْسٌ بِأَيِّ أَرْضٍ تَمُوتُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Indeed, Allah is all-knowing, well-acquainted. So I can assure you that these guys, the fortune tellers, the soothsayers, have no knowledge of the future whatsoever. But they are able to influence their followers and deceive them through the utilization of the jinn. Sometimes they transmit the news, oh, this guy knows the future. Whoever believes that other than the Almighty Allah knows the unseen is a kafir. I'm saying it in Arabic so that those who hear me among Muslims, 
know that this is not a game. Even if you pray five times a day and you go to a fortune teller and you ask him or her about what is going to happen to you or you know you want to know the future or what is hidden for you this is disbelief. So the Messenger of Allah says in the sound hadith من أتى عرافا أو كاهنا فصدقه فقد كفر بما أنزل على محمد From among Muslims whoever visits عراف يعني سوسير a kahin fortune teller soothsayers and they believe that they can tell them about the future has indeed disbelieved in the message which was given to Muhammad there is no joke about it this is not a game so those who say I know that liars but I just want to check it out they read my cards they look in my coffee uh, cup they read my palm these activities are disbelief and those who seek their guidance or help, even joking, checking it out, they become disbelievers. Cut all ties with those people. Don't even, you gotta believe that they are liars and they have no access to know the future nor the unseen whatsoever. It is only in Allah's knowledge. Thank you. And it is time to take a short break. Inshallah, I'll be back in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back drawn towards the end of today's edition of Ask Huda. This is the last segment and we have a few more minutes to take some of your calls. Bismillah, the first caller. Brother Muhsin from the USA, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum, can you hear me? Clearly, mashallah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So my question is, um, Praying on the plane, um, from what I know, you, you have to stand up, but pretend it's not like, you know, the, how do you say, the business class or like the first class, but, you know, you're like in the regular, right, you know, the economy, a bunch of people together. Um, how do you uh, go about this? Um, if it's like economy, should you stay sitting down or um, what, what, what do you suggest? Should I ask the flight attendant? You know, um, that's pretty much my question. Thank you, Muhsin. I've discussed this thoroughly in a program called uh, The Prophet's Prayer. And now to answer your question in brief, there is no standard because airliners differ on their way of treating Muslims, including some Muslim airliners. Sometimes on Lufthansa, I spoke to the flight attendant, I'm a Muslim, I want to pray. She said, of course, come. And she made it feasible for me to pray even in the first class. I wasn't sitting there, but she made it feasible. Thank you so much. So through my experience, I came to know that before taking it easy and praying in your seat and uh, without facing the Qibla, why don't you ask? Some, uh, you know, uh, recently on Malaysian airline when they said, no, 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 of course, there is a place where can you offer the prayer. It's in the exit area. And they have a curtain, and they show you where is the Qibla. So all what I did, I asked. I just simply asked. On another Muslim airliner, the flight was delayed for several hours, and people started standing up and stretching and so on. So the Fajr Adhan was called. Then close to sunrise, I got up and I said, may I just offer my prayer? No, this is not permissible. I said, at least can I stretch? Oh, yes, that is okay. So I said, Allahu Akbar, and I started offering my prayer. You know, the mindset is different. Some people are understanding and some people are very, you know, may Allah guide us all. So the conclusion is, if it is a prayer where I can pray before I board the flight, or if I wait until I land, I still have time, then I shouldn't be praying while airborne. I wait until I land. And I offer my prayer facing the Qibla, making wudu and in the standing position. No, sometimes I fly for 19 hours in the same flight. So this is several prayers. Okay? So in this case, I ask if it is feasible or not. And sometimes when people are asleep and it is dark, 
I take advantage and in between uh, the business class and the economy, I just put my blanket and I say, or I, s I have the uh, nylon janamaz or pear rug and uh, I stand up and I pray and nobody says anything. But if I am prevented, sir, you cannot do this here. Oh no, thank you so much. I'll go to my seat and I will pray with me, in my case, I cannot pray in the standing position because I will hit my uh, head uh, in the drawer on, on top of me. People can stand up. In this case, they stand up, they make ruku, and in the sujood position, they sit on their seat and they lower their head. Bottom line is, keep your duty to Allah according to the best of your ability. Because the Nabi Sallallahu said to the Sahabi, the companion who asked him about the prayer, he said, you should be standing up in the fourth prayer. But if you can't, then you may sit down. And if you can't, you can even pray while lying down. So before moving to the next level, I need to find out whether it is possible or not. Coming home from uh, Hajj. On the flight next to me, somebody who just decided you know, there was plenty of time to pray Fajr before boarding the flight, but he didn't. And he made wudu and he prayed in his seat, the opposite of the Qibla. So I told him that as a matter of fact, they're still boarding the flight and he can face the Qibla with ease. And when he asked, they said, as a matter of fact, we have a Musalla in the plane. He neglected all of that and he didn't even pray again. Is his Fajr prayer valid? No, it is not valid because you have the option to stand up to face the Qibla and there is a designated area on the Saudi airline where you can pray while standing and you chose not to then the prayer is invalid I hope the answer is sufficient Assalamu Alaikum Hafiz from Nigeria Assalamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Assalam Ya Sheikh Welcome to ask with Hafiz Welcome How is it our Alhamdulillah, everything is great. Thank you for asking. And at your end? MashaAllah, may Allah reward you abundantly. I mean, same to you, Hafiz. Barakallah fikum. So what is your question today? Uh, on a prayer day, Jumu'at, when Imam doing Huduba, in the middle of, in the middle of Huduba, he can sit down and relax. My question is that, is there any dua that is acceptable from hadith or Quran in that moment? In this time, it is best to make istighfar, to say astaghfirullah al wa atubu alayh, without raising your hands. In the khutbah of the Jumu'ah prayer, you don't raise your hands, whether in the middle or whenever the Imam is reciting the supplication. When the Imam is reciting the supplication by the end of his sermon, you say, Ameen. That is prescribed, but without raising the hands. In the middle, you say, when the Imam, Astaghfirullah wa tubu ilayhi, seek forgiveness from Allah and repent unto him. And then he sits for a couple minutes, you say, Astaghfirullah al wa atubu ilayhi. Barakallahu feekum hafeeh from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Samina from the USA, welcome to Ask Uda. Samina. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have a question related to Vitera and Tahajjud. Mm -hmm. um, I try to do Tahajjud um, as much as I can, but it's not certain. So, I sometimes I uh, leave my wither to be prayed with the hajjud, but then at the same time, if I do not get up, I miss the hajjud as well as wither. Mm. Hello. I hear you, Samina. Go ahead. So, what is preferable if um, I intend to pray the hajjud every day, but I'm not sure? Should I be praying wither with my isha so I don't miss it, or should I just take the risk? and leave it that if I do get up for tahajjud, I pray with it. Well, in the sound hadith, Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, narrated that he said, my best companion, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, enjoined upon me three things. 
One of them he said, وَأَنْ أُوْتِرَ قَبْلَ أَنْ أَنَامْ And to make sure I pray which before going to sleep. We have some of the companions, like Abu Bakr Siddiq, who would make sure that he will pray which before going to sleep. On the opposite, Umar ibn Khattab would delay his witch because he's certain I'm going to get up and pray tahajjud in the last one third of the night, so let me pray tahajjud then pray witch. So the decision of when to pray what is based on your choice and capacity. I'm a person who regularly pray tahajjud. So in this case, keep the witch by the end. Like in Ramadan, what do we do? We keep witch the last after we have suhoor because we know that we'll be praying tahajjud. If you know that I'm not going to wake up, or I'm very tired, then it is better to pray Isha, then the Sunnah. If you if you can afford to pray a few rakahs or not, then pray Witr and go to sleep. What if I'm, alhamdulillah, awake? Even though I pray Witr, no problem. Pray two by two and don't pray another Witr. What if I set up my alarm and I was very keen to pray Tahajjud in Witr and I didn't get up and I missed Tahajjud and Witr altogether? Well, Aisha radiallahu anha provided us with the answer. She said, whenever the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, would be too tired and would miss his tahajjud and witr, he will make them up during the day. So after sunrise and until before dhuhr, there is plenty of time. He used to pray his uh, regular night prayer, two by two, and then his width will not be one rak'ah or three, rather it will be two in the evening. Because width, in a sense of praying odd, is only prescribed for the night. So if the Prophet وسلم, used to pray 11 rak'ahs every night, and he overslept, or he was traveling, and then he wants to make it up during the day between sunrise and dhuh, he will make them 12 rak'ahs, not 11. Thank you, Sister Samina from the USA. We can take one more call before we conclude today's episode. Sister Shazia from the USA, welcome to Ask Uda. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Saleh. I just have a one quick question. Please go ahead. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah, so just wanted to know if uh, is, is it okay to give the cut money for somebody's surgery, somebody need to get surgery done or somebody, you know, very sick and need help. Is okay. it okay to give all the zakat money to one person? Shazia, Shazia are them? they poor or can they afford it? Uh, obviously, they, they, they cannot afford the surgery. That's why they needed uh, help. Then, but in I this don't case, know how poor then they are, in this case, know, the family. This, in this case, it is much more worthy than giving the zakat to somebody to buy food because this is a necessity, surgery, treatment, medication. So you go ahead and give them as much as you want of your zakat to make them sufficiently capable to have the surgery as early and as soon as possible. May Allah reward you, Sister Shazia. Even if this person is a sibling, a nephew, a niece, a cousin, any family member apart from the parents and the children because supporting parents and grandparents, supporting children and grandchildren should be from my own money. But siblings, and their children, cousins, uncles, nephews, nieces from my zakah and you know that they are in need, Bismillah, give them as much as you want. May Allah bless you and your family and may Allah cure those who are going for a surgery. May Allah accept from all of us. We humbly request the Almighty Allah to pardon us and forgive us our sins and to guide us toward his best. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilma. Wa alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal wa na'udhu billahi min hali ahli al-nar. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. نستغفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Permit me to 
past the ultimate test Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance and 